Welcome to this educational activity where Dr. William Rigby from the Geisel School of Medicine at Dartmouth in New Hampshire uses a novel storytelling approach to offer insights into the role of JAK inhibitors in the treatment of patients with rheumatoid arthritis. The following audio is part of a certified educational activity titled JAK Inhibitors in Rheumatoid Arthritis, Aligning Pathophysiology, Treatment Advances, and Patient Preference into a Personalized Approach to Care for Improved Outcomes. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at www.peerviewpress.com forward slash JVX. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Today I want to talk to you about the role of JAK inhibitors in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. I'm going to tell you about the experiences of two of my patients that I have had with these agents. The first patient I will tell you about is Elena. Elena was previously employed as a bookkeeper at a small foundry. She has been married for 37 years with two grown children and two grandchildren. She loves gardening but has been limited by pain and stiffness in her hands, knees, and feet. And she misses the direct connection with the soil and watching things grow. When I first met Elena in 2012, she was 58 years old and was referred to me from another rheumatologist. She came in for an evaluation of seropositive rheumatoid arthritis, which she had had for about eight years. And this occurred in the context of known bilateral knee osteoarthritis. She had had chronic knee pain with partial response to steroid injections. But her rheumatoid arthritis had to be treated with methotrexate, then prednisone, then triple therapy, which is methotrexate, sulfasalazine, and hydroxychloroquine. And none of these had worked particularly well. So when I examined Elena for the very first time, I found metacarpal phalangeal, wrist and shoulder pain and tenderness. She also had tenderness in her feet along her metatarsal phalangeal joints, so that when I squeezed, the, squeezed them, she would uh, practically uh, wince in pain, if not try to hit me. She also had five degree flexion contractures of her knees with very limited motion. So her rheumatoid arthritis and knee osteoarthritis impacted her health-related quality of life due to the constant pain. She had no insurance, she could not afford a knee replacement, and she was chronically and angry, chronically angry and depressed about these symptoms and the fact that she could not do much about them. We injected her knees with triamcinolone, a setonide, for very good effect. And one month later, she entered a clinical trial for an IL-6 receptor inhibitor that was given intravenously at monthly intervals. In June 2016, she completed nearly four years of treatment in this trial. The first six months she could have had placebo or active drug, but it was pretty clear she had active drug and she had a good response. Her knees remained a constant source of pain with partial relief from steroid injections, which she would only accept on a once a year basis. When the trial ended, she could not get coverage for her IL-6 receptor inhibitor. And so despite continued methotrexate and low-dose prednisone, five milligrams a day, as maintenance therapy, Elena experienced a progressive return of hand pain and stiffness. And this was accompanied again by more anger and depression. But this past January, she was able to get a JAK inhibitor through an indigent use program. She reported having a dramatic benefit within 10 days of starting this medication. She was able to go back to gardening, which made her feel so much happier. Her exact words, and I, I remember this like it happened yesterday, where I feel like I've had a personality transplant. I feel so much better. It was unbelievable. This is a person who I've taken care of for four or five years, always mad, always angry, always negotiating these and trying to optimize the care of her rheumatoid arthritis. So I was somewhat surprised because I knew she had knee osteoarthritis, that she felt so much better. And I said, do your knees feel better? Do they move better? And she said, it's not that they move better. It's not that they don't hurt. It's just that everything else doesn't hurt as much. And that made a huge difference for her, as it seemed that the rheumatoid arthritis symptoms that she was experiencing was a straw breaking her back or the camel's back, so to speak. So let's take a second and explore the use of the JAK inhibitors, and in particular tofacitinib, which is the one JAK inhibitor that's currently approved and available by the FDA. 
It's available since 2012. It was initially a twice daily medication and subsequently it's been available as a once daily medication since 2016, 11 milligrams taken once a day. It's approved for rheumatoid arthritis, both as monotherapy as well as combination therapy in patients that have failed standard care. And it's been st extensively studied. In fact, so extensively studied that we're gonna take a step back and we're gonna review what kind of studies are important right now in the decision to use drugs in treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. There are basically four questions that we need to address when we use a drug in rheumatoid arthritis. Does it work in patients that have not responded to methotrexate, which is standard of care? How well does it work relative to a TNF inhibitor? Third, how well does it work in patients that have not responded to a TNF inhibitor? And finally, how well does this drug work as monotherapy, that is in the absence of any other medication? Because the standard of care in rheumatoid arthritis is always to use background methotrexate or another conventional synthetic DMAR. Uh, abbreviated sometimes as CSDMAR. In the oral solo study, tofacitinib as monotherapy was examined in patients that had either a non-response to non-biologic therapy, so-called conventional synthetic DMARDs, or biologic D DMARDs. And as monotherapy, tofacitinib taken five milligrams twice a day had remarkable effects on ACR20 re response rates, which are a composite measure, as well as physical functioning as measured by HACK and other measures. In the START trial, it was looked at patients who had never been on methotrexate. And at, uh, not unexpectedly, tofacitinib monotherapy was superior to baseline methotrexate. The reason I say not unexpectedly is that tofacitinib had been shown already to be working in patients non-responsive to methotrexate, so it was not surprising to see that it was superior to methotrexate alone in methotrexate-naive patients. The likelihood of having a high hurdle response, it is an ACR70 response, which is probably the highest level of response that you can get in a rheumatoid arthritis clinical trial, was twice as good with tofacitinib as it was with methotrexate. So perhaps one of the most interesting studies that's come out recently about tofacitinib in rheumatoid arthritis is the oral strategy study, which compared tofacitinib to the combination of adalimumab and methotrexate in patients with an inadequate response to methotrexate. Now at six months in this clinical trial, the ACR50 response was measured. In patients with tofacitinib monotherapy, 38% of this refractory patient population improved. If you use tofacitinib with methotrexate, it worked as well as adalimumab with methotrexate, meaning about 44 to 46% of the patients had these high hurdle responses. So non-inferiority was declared for tofacitinib and methotrexate versus adalimumab and methotrexate. But I want to emphasize that nearly 40% of the patients responded in a very substantial way to tofacitinib alone as monotherapy. The other JAK inhibitor that's in the, uh, in the eaves, so to speak, or in the wings waiting to come out on the stage is a drug called baricitinib. Baricitinib is another JAK inhibitor that's already approved in Europe and is currently in late stage development in the United States. It's different from, it's different from tofacitinib, it's slightly in its biologic activity. It's also a once daily therapy, and it's been extensively studied using the parameters that I referred to earlier. The RA BUILD study compared baricitinib to placebo in patients who had an inadequate response or intolerance to conventional synthetic DMARDs. Now, baricitinib had great activity for both clinical and patient-reported outcomes, with ACR20 response rates of 62%, which is as high as you ever see in these kinds of clinical trials. Perhaps the most important uh, trial, I th in my personal view, for the, uh, the, how we think about JAK inhibitors is the RA Beacons trial that was conducted with baricitinib. The reason why I say it was the most important is that it was looked at using a patient population that was extremely refractory and with long-term disease. Now, long-term rheumatoid arthritis means that you have a lot of mechanical joint disease and mechanical damage that influence how patients feel on a daily basis. This clinical trial, the mean disease duration of this patient population was 14 years. Despite this long disease duration and this heavily pre-treated nature of this patient, some of these patients have been on five biologics. 
baricitinib have had very positive rates on clinical and patient reported outcomes, with ACR20 uh, rates of 55% versus 27% with placebo. So in other words, this drug, which is very similar to tofacitinib in its, uh, what, what proteins it targets, had an, a very, very positive outcome. And this trial really resonates with me because I have a lot of these patients in my practice who have been, uh, who have long-standing mechanical disease superimposed on top of their inflammatory disease. The RA Beam study was another absolutely important study in that it compared baricitinib to adalimumab in patients with an inadequate response to methotrexate. And this was the study that shown not biologic equivalence but superiority to a TNF antagonist in this patient population. And these effects were so striking with baricitinib that they were really apparent as early as two to four weeks after the initiation of therapy. And that brings up one of the points I'd like to let, have you all think about, is these drugs work fast. They're an oral agent, and we typically think oral agents don't, shouldn't work as fast as an intravenous agent, but these drugs work fast. And this is really interesting because here it's beating an injectable, it's being injectable, it's taken a, uh, uh, that's targeting a specific cytokine, a TNF agent that's very important in rheumatoid arthritis. And yet, taking a pill once a day made a huge difference and faster difference in patient reported outcomes, as well as meaning how the patient felt, as well as any measures that a rheumatologist would make in their office. This effect of uh, baricitinib has not just been shown in these highly refractory patient populations, it's also been shown in mo as monotherapy. Baricitinib was compared to methotrexate monotherapy in early disease, early rheumatoid arthritis disease, and it was clearly superior. So what I want you all to remember is baricitinib is effective regardless of patient age, body mass index, number of previous years of treatment, number of previous use conventional synthetic DMARDs, number of biologics, and it's been sustained through two years. This is a parallel to what's been seen with tofacitinib, where very long benefit has been shown to occur. That is, these agents have enduring activity. So let's talk about the JAK inhibitors and the whole question of selectivity because I'm sure you're gonna be confronting a whole host of JAK inhibitors coming down the pipeline. Remember, the JAK inhibitors inhibit one of four particular kinases, JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, or TIC2. And what's interesting is that tofacitinib mainly works on JAK1 and JAK3, baricitinib mainly works on JAK1 and JAK2, and there are many other kinase inhibitors that are coming down the pipeline that are being actively studied. They're either specific for JAK1 or JAK3. Now, what's really striking about these JAK inhibitors is that despite their selectivity, they all seem to exhibit the same level of efficacy, and they all seem to live, exhibit the same level of safe, safety issues. They all seem to exhibit the same level of laboratory abnormalities. So what I want you to think about is that the JAK inhibitors are a little bit mysterious and that they have very specific effects in the test tube, but they have very common effects in the human body. And this is one of the mysteries about JAK inhibitors. They work so fast, they work so effectively, but how exactly are they working or where exactly are they working? So when I think about this, I always think about uh, the striking thing about these JAK inhibitors. You're taking a pill that's inhibiting a key inflammatory pathway all throughout your body. Remember, these drugs are working on JAK1, JAK2, JAK3, TIC2, and every cell in our body that has those kinases. And despite that, the safety is the same relative to a biologic. The only thing that seems to stand out that's a little bit different and in some ways is highly informative about biology is that there seems to be a slightly increased risk of zoster or shingles with these agents. In North America, it's not particularly increased, but in the Asian patient population that have been studied, it's probably a little bit higher, probably twice as high. This does not appear to be related to pharmacology, but these, this zoster issue is usually not a clinically significant issue. Immunization for zoster can be attempted and probably, been, probably is effective. The next patient I want to talk about is Kim. 
When I first met Kim, she was 38 years old. Six months earlier, she had just given birth to her third child in five years, a healthy baby boy named Luke. She came to see me because she had pain and swelling in her hands and feet. Her MCPs and MTP joints, that is the small joints of her hands and feet, were obviously swollen with three hours of morning stiffness. And this was despite me seeing her in the afternoon with Luke in her arms. As you can imagine, this substantially impacted the burden of a new mother who was also taking care of two other children, who she was recovering from giving birth and experiencing fatigue from losing sleep due to nighttime's feedings. She had difficulty caring for her baby as well as the other two toddlers. She had difficulty picking him up. She had difficulty changing his diapers due to the pain and stiffness in her hands. Her lab work showed an elevated C-reactor protein of 15 milligrams per liter showing systemic inflammation and her blood tests for rheumatoid arthritis, or CCP3, and rheumatoid factor were both markedly positive. So I discussed with Kim what options we had for her with her new onset seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. And she was adamant that she wanted to nurse Luke until he was one year of age. We treated her with prednisone for five milligrams a day for six months. Remember, this is six months postpartum. And after that, I initiated treatment with methotrexate 20 milligrams a week. After six months, she had not had any response. Her clinical disease activity index was 36, greater than 22 is considered high. So we added a TNF inhibitor to her methotrexate therapy. And after six months on the TNF inhibitor, she always trying to think that she was having a response, but to tell you the truth, she really wasn't having a response. She still had a high disease activity of 24 with eight tender and swollen joints in her hands alone. And after 12 months, her C dye went back up from 24 to 31. So it was basically back to baseline. Kim was very frustrated as she still had trouble using her hands and as a result had difficulty taking care of Luke and enjoying time with her family. Her husband was concerned about her ability to care for three active children when she was by herself with them all day while he was working. Moreover, I want to emphasize that Kim loved babies. She loved having babies. She loved taking care of toddlers. So all of this was uh, affecting her sense of self and her enjoyment of life. So we switched her from a TNF inhibitor to a treatment with a different mechanism of action, an antibody directed against CD20, continuing her background methotrexate. After two courses over the next year, her clinical disease activity index was moderate at 12, with eight swollen and tender MCP joints, or hand joints. She asked me, can I do better? And I had to say that I thought we could. So we decided to switch Kim to a JAK inhibitor. And one of the points that I want to make today is that, again, she responded right away. And within two months, her clinical disease activity index, which had been in the 30s, was now less than five. She had minimal pain and swelling in her hands and feet, was better able to take care of Luke and enjoy time with her family. Overall, she seemed much happier than I had ever seen her before, and I was very happy that we could finally find something that worked for her. It's challenging when you fail, when drugs don't work as billed or as you hope they, they would work, and you have to constantly move to another agent with your patients. She was successful with the JAK inhibitor for about two years and even went to monotherapy. That is, she got to stop her methotrexate, and she went off her prednisone and felt just as well as she did when she was on them, if not better. Unfortunately, her husband's insurance carrier changed and she had to stop taking the JAK inhibitor because it was no longer covered. I pleaded with the, uh, her insurance carrier. I even had peer-to-peer -peer conversations. And they said, we have a firm rule that the patient has to fail two TNF inhibitors before a JAK inhibitor could be covered by her new insurance. We switched her to a TNF inhibitor. It was a different one she had taken before, but keep in mind I had previously explained to her that switching treatment classes may be more effective. So she was kind of going back to a non-effective treatment class, leaving a drug that had worked great for her for a couple of years. So you can imagine the trepidation she has felt, and I'm still waiting to hear back and see what the final outcome of this is. So I've told you about the emotional experience of rheumatoid arthritis the burden of pain and suffering, the limitations in physical function through the stories of Kim and Elena. 
And I've also used Kim's experience to highlight the issue regarding insurance coverage and costs in the management of rheumatoid arthritis. Rheumatoid arthritis continues to be a significant economic burden in the United States. The average medical expenditure per person for patients with rheumatoid arthritis is $17,000 per year. If you aggregate that per year, the average uh, aggregate medical expenditures for rheumatoid arthritis are $17.8 billion from 2008 to 2011. And I think that actually underestimates what the real cost is. And the costs not only come from the cost of the specialty drugs, but it comes from all the other factors associated with rheumatoid arthritis, the drug testing, the toxicities, and so forth. And one of the things that's very clear is that if you switch treatments too quickly, or you switch treatment because of non-adherence and patients not taking the drug, that's obviously going to amplify your health care costs. Now, cost effectiveness is a very interesting issue. Multiple studies in various uh, settings have suggested that biologic medications are not cost effective in the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. For example, a recent study found that initiating biologic therapy without trying triple therapy first increased your cost while providing minimal incremental benefit. I take exception to many of these studies because they really do not account for patient suffering. And what I really want to point out to you today is that the JAK inhibitors are oral treatments. And therefore, there's a lot of costs that they do not incur that infusibles or injectables do occur. A study using a transparent economic model with a decision tree approach suggested that tofacitinib, five milligrams twice daily, following a non-response to methotrexate, exhibits lower cost per patient treatment when used as monotherapy or in combination with methotrexate compared with biologic. Tofacitinib with methotrexate in a TNF inadequate responder patient population was also predicted to be the lower cost option compared with adalimumab plus methotrexate and was associated with the lowest cost per response, meaning ACR 20, 50, or 70. The other thing that we think about when we treat patients with rheumatoid arthritis with drugs is not only how effective they are and what their cost effectiveness is, we also talk about patient adherence, we talk about how well these drugs work and so forth. And there's several features of the JAK inhibitors that I'd like you to think about that are very important and might have downstream consequences. One, they work very quickly. Therefore, you could start somebody on a drug, and if they've not responded at 8 to 12 weeks, you know you're out of there. You're not going to continue giving a drug. That doesn't work. That is not true of the other biologics. The other biologics oftentimes have an effect that builds over three to six months. So I want to make a point that, to me, there's nothing more expensive than a drug that doesn't work. And from a safety point of view, there's nothing more dangerous than a drug that doesn't work. So the fact that you can get in and out with a drug in 12 weeks and make a clear readout on whether that patient's going to respond is a really big deal. So higher out-of-pocket payments negatively impact adherence to biologics as well, and that's probably an important element with oral therapy because patients with injectables have to pay for the plastic, pay for the device, and also sometimes have to pay for coming into the hospital and receiving their intravenous medication. I bring this up because the lower cost of oral agents therefore could positively influence patient adherence and outcomes, and that in turn could be more cost effective. I think it's really uh, important to emphasize that the oral roots is, is, uh, more, uh, is probably the most important attribute of rheumatoid arthritis treatment in terms of asking patients what's the most important attribute to them. They do, surprisingly enough, they don't say, I want a drug that works. They kind of take that at face value. The most important thing they say is that they rather take it orally rather than self-administration or injection. So if you understand this, you can improve your patient preferences and you can possibly get them to buy into taking the drug on a regular basis. So if you have a highly effective agent, one drug, and this is the big advantage of the JAK inhibitors as monotherapy, and this is why we all want to emphasize this, one drug taken by mouth that works quickly and works effectively the patients get a lot of buy-in and adherence follows. So in conclusion, the JAK inhibitors are highly effective in safe treatments for rheumatoid arthritis. I hope you appreciate that they act quickly and that they're effective in various patient populations, including both treatment-naive and refractory patient populations. 
They are effective both as monotherapy and combination therapy. The JAK inhibitors may be preferred by many patients because one, they're oral rather than injectable, and two, they work quickly. That is, patients have a great response right away. So this reinforces their use and increases their likelihood of adherence. The JAK inhibitors have the potential to lead to substantial cost savings for a variety of factors that I've discussed. But most of all, I want to thank you very much for listening to my stories about Elena and Kim, who make these therapies come alive to me as a practitioner. I hope you have found them enlightening and helpful in your own future endeavors. Thank you very much. This activity has been jointly provided by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated and PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at www.peerviewpress.com forward slash JVX. This activity is supported by an educational grant from Lilly. For further information concerning Lilly Grant funding, visit www.lillygrantoffice.com.